Hey everyone, it's snowing, we have a beautiful day, and I'm very happy Great. that it was possible to uh, get you to appear for us. We have had two intensive days and you are sort of the final uh, event here now. And, uh, and uh, I acknowledge that you were the impulse for me when I went to your workshop in 1988 and uh, we were building this uh, new workshop for one of your employees that it had burned down. So we have been talking a lot about burnt down buildings that are replaced by timber frames now. So with that, over to you. Okay, and um, Johannes, um, can you give me permission to share the screen? Okay, it works. Okay, everyone is seeing my screen. Good morning, everyone. And uh, one of the things I appreciate about this being the last uh, presentation in the conference is that you, all of you are uh, tired, uh, ready to go, and probably ready for me, me to uh, finish quickly, if at all possible. So uh, I'll, I'll try to keep that in mind. Uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about um, our company's journey. Uh, I call it a journey for a better way to build. Uh, this is actually our 50th year. We're a little um, uncertain about uh, 1972 or 1973, so we're calling the 50 years sort of the bridge between uh, those two years. And of course, I think of it as an unfinished uh, journey. Um, it may be toward the end of the road for me, but um, it's it's a continuing journey for our company. Uh, and uh, Johannes knows a little bit about this. Uh, I am um, mostly Swedish, and uh, my relatives um, are all Bengtsons, and uh, I have been reconnecting with them along with my siblings and cousins for the last uh, 15 years. So just to, for all the Swedes here, uh, you're right here in uh, Marisad, and uh, my uh, great Grandfather is uh, buried here in Raman. I have relatives in Lissafors, in Philippstad, and uh, Karlstad. Uh, so my relatives are up in this area. And uh, I told Johannes that uh, my cousin and I are actually have been working toward the goal of building a small uh, cottage uh, in this area. Uh, we actually have land here uh, next to one of our uh, relatives, our cousins. Um, however, uh, that's been difficult. Um, we've had trouble with the getting approval for the septic system. And I think uh, we are all kind of coalescing around the idea that we're going to use a family building that's in Raman. Uh, it's a, a train station that is there and it's owned by the family. They don't use it a whole lot. There's a wonderful apartment up here in the second floor. So instead of building, it's most likely uh, we're going to become um, part owners and occupants of a, of a small uh, train station in Raman, which is a beautiful, beautiful building and a wonderful place as all of you know. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, bringing this to you as Ted Bingston. Uh, so uh, this is a story so far, and I'm going to kind of divide it up into uh, little sections just to make it convenient. And the first part is context, like where did this come from? Where did the whole idea of getting into timber framing? What were our goals? Uh, so that's the context. Uh, there's two parts under the heading of what was. Uh, and the first part I'm going to call the early years, and uh, then the heydays. Uh, heydays were 
maybe around uh, 1986, seven through 2002, three, four in those years. And then uh, what is, what we're doing now, um, what things look like now, the technology we're using now, and, and just a tiny little bit about what I think might be coming uh, next for our company. So um, hang on to your hats. I'm going to go fast. Um, uh, Johannes uh, shortened my time uh, because of your photo at the end. Uh, so I'm going to fly through this. Some of the details are not that important. I think the story is more or less important uh, to give you some understanding of how a company like ours got founded and how we actually ended up surviving uh, through these 50 years. So uh, context comes into uh, several categories. It's a, why do homes matter for me? Uh, I, I learned early on that homes matter deeply in lives. Uh, I learned a lot about really bad building and then the best of building. Uh, there was a 1970s energy crisis that actually had a big influence on me and our company. Um, and then <clears throat> we eventually became committed through all of that to in our early years to developing a better way to build. And that led us uh, into timber framing. So about uh, me, I'm the sixth of 11 children. Uh, we grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, and my parents were just wonderful, amazing human beings. Uh, uh, so we were just wealthy in love and uh, integrity and uh, uh, good bonding as a family. Uh, but we were pretty poor financially. And uh, in our early years, we lived in this little uh, tract home uh, on the east end of Colorado Springs. And the worst thing about it was not its size, which was obviously challenging for a big family, but how poorly it was built. It was it was really just a wooden shack, um, uh, even, even though it was a relatively new home. Uh, however, uh, in 1957, my dad uh, found a home uh, in the downtown area of Colorado Springs that was scheduled for demolition. Uh, it's actually to make way for a parking lot for a bank. And uh, he was able to save it, uh, bought it for a dollar, and then paid all the money to have it moved up the street, backed onto a foundation. Um, and therefore, we grew up in this wonderful, um, really well-built, well-crafted uh, home that was built in 1890. And uh, it saved our family. Uh, it, it saved us, not just because it was bigger, it was better. Uh, it told us that we cared, that we mattered in this world. Uh, and it was a place of, of sanctity. Uh, it was a sanctuary for our hopes and dreams, as well as uh, just embracing our family. So I learned early on that homes can change lives, and it, as it did for me. Um, um, because we were a relatively financially challenged uh, family, all of us uh, had jobs as soon as we were able to work. And uh, when I was in uh, early in high school, I was able to work on construction jobs and uh, do some uh, carpentry, even as a teenager. I was able to swing a big hammer, and that's all that mattered. Um, so I worked on uh, this development and a few others uh, in those years doing doing really basic uh, framing carpentry along with a crew of, of fellows who um, didn't actually um, teach me very much. Uh, they didn't care very much. They didn't know very much. Uh, most of their tools were a bad attitude and uh, swearing and uh, and so it didn't inspire me, and especially because we had grown up in our early years in homes just like the ones we were building, it was really discouraging uh, and did not encourage me to become a, a carpenter or get into building. Um, I, it was actually completely the opposite. Uh, but um, in the middle years of college, um, I moved uh, with my soon-to-be wife uh, from uh, Colorado to Concord, Massachusetts, where 
Um, she was finishing school at uh, Boston University. I intended to finish at Harvard, um, but I had to earn money first. And I got jobs in the Concord, Carlisle, Lexington area of Massachusetts, uh, where I worked with a crew of incredibly talented, capable carpenters who were, you know, second generation, third generation uh, people who cared, who knew, who um, who really appreciated the craft of building and uh, knew it well. Uh, so a total opposite of what I had experienced in uh, Colorado. And, uh, and those uh, carpenter builders were the ones who introduced me to things like the Odell's Carpenters and Builders Guide and uh, Fred Hodgkin, Hodgson books um, about the framing square. There were actually two volumes about the framing square and uh, and a book that he wrote called Light and Heavy Timber Framing Made Easy. And here we are, were, just to go back a slide, almost always doing renovation and remodeling of buildings in the Concord area. And they were every one of them timber frames uh, because they had been built before, you know, 1870 or so. And so it was my first introduction to timber frames and just seeing them and working on buildings that were several hundred years old and being renovated instead of torn down was really impressive. Uh, so I became really enamored of timber framing just through that experience of working on buildings that were built so well and had survived so handsomely. So um, long story short, I, I had the opportunity to get a job in the Walpole, New Hampshire area, about uh, 90 miles from Boston. And uh, I discovered the same thing, a community of uh, buildings in the uh, Walpole, Alstead, Westmoreland area, same thing buildings, homes that were 200 years old or 150 years old, up to 250 years old that were still there surviving, kind of defining the town. They were all timber frames. And once again, I was doing more renovation and remodeling work than new construction. So there we were uh, looking at these wonderful old timber frames and renovating these buildings. So it was completely inspiring. <clears throat> and and I became very obsessed with uh, looking at the timber frames in the area, um, the barns, the churches, the houses, uh, wherever I could. It was became an avocation. At the same time, in nineteen in the nineteen seventies, there were two incredibly significant energy crises uh, that affected the whole world. The first one was nineteen seventy three. The second was nineteen seventy nine. Our company was just getting uh, started in this period. It had a deep influence in how we thought about a better way to build. A better way to build had to include homes that perform better in terms of insulation and air tightness so that they would be more energy in, uh, efficient. Uh, in that period, uh, in the 1970s, uh, there was a group that actually settled in uh, Harrisville, New Hampshire, not far from um, what soon became our home in Walpole and Alstead. So <clears throat> it was a, a national organization kind of inspired by the energy crisis uh, to find uh, and develop um, more energy efficient home building methods. Uh, this fellow, Bruce Anderson, wrote this book in 1975 uh, that you know, became a bit of a Bible for us. Total Environmental Action founded Solar Age magazine. A little later in that decade, um, uh, Ed Masria wrote this wonderful book about passive solar energy. So this was actually the gestalt of the time, how to make buildings that were better. And it turned out that some of the leading uh, scientists uh, at that time were in my backyard. So that had a huge influence. They became good friends, colleagues, and affected uh, all of our buildings uh, for the next uh, 40 years. Uh, also in that period, um, Jimmy Carter was our president, and he uh, he also made a, 
a, a, a total dedication toward energy efficiency, energy conservation, as it was called at that time. Uh, even put uh, solar panels on the white uh, on the White House. I found that all of that completely inspiring, and dedicated everything that our company would do toward these same goals. Uh, so uh, I just am making this point that we, as we were uh, migrating toward timber framing, we were also migrating uh, definitely uh, toward energy efficiency as a method. Um, I hope all of you will appreciate this. Uh, this is what was happening in Sweden at the same time. It was a uh, international crisis, this energy crisis of the 70s. And uh, Sweden, of course, responded to. Uh, they were affected. You guys were affected also. And uh, in 1977, um, uh, responding to that energy crisis here, um, Sweden went so far as to mandate uh, triple clean, uh, pane windows already. And, you know, here's the energy code from 1975. It exceeded our code even through 2006. The two th 1984 electric code um, it was the equivalent of about the um, building code of 2015 um, for our, our country. A little difference here is that this is a more or less a national code in Sweden. Uh, and for us, um, unfortunately, the codes kind of vary all over the country. But you could say that the 1984 electric code was pretty much the equivalent of the 2015 code. Uh, so, wow. <laughs> and so we did a little analysis about that, like what would have happened if our country had stayed on that path instead of dropping it when Ronald Reagan was elected and Jimmy Carter left the, the White House. Um, if we had been on the same path as Sweden, we could have been energy independent by 2012. Instead, <laughs> we went a, in a completely different direction. And so that's very disappointing. I want to um, just uh, tell all of you that I uh, ha have become just a, a total fan of the building standards in Sweden. And it has been a model uh, for our company uh, through all these years. So what was um, from the early days of our company, from 1972, 73, uh, it was a mission for a better way to build and trying to, as Gandhi said, you know, to be the change we wanted in the world. Uh, so we founded the company um, and uh, the early years, I, as you can imagine, were challenging, uh, but we were kind of dedicated to uh, buildings, not just timber frames, but buildings that would be more beautiful, more durable, more functional, following the Vitruvian triad, uh, the great uh, Vitruvius from 2000 years ago. We added energy efficiency and called it parsis. So, you know, in the Latin uh, terms, venustas, firmitas, utilitas, and parsis. Um, we thought, you know, that our dedication toward that reviving timber framing and bringing energy efficiency into the picture. We should have be developing a craft ethos, uh, bringing the best tools and technology, creating a better work environment, more like what I exper experienced in the Concord Carlisle area, not the Colorado Springs area. And because I was doing some cabinet making at the time, definitely offsite building. Uh, as a way to control quality uh, tooling and um, uh, overall work efficiency. Uh, in that, oh, those early years, um, because I was so fascinated with timber framing, uh, I stopped at every barn and house and church in the area, and I, you know, wanted to look at the timber frame and study it and take notes, and uh, so I. I, some people looked at me kind of weird, like, you really want to look at that? And 
Every once in a while, they said, well, if you're so interested in that barn, do you want it? Uh, I can no longer afford to keep it up or it's starting to fall down. Um, so I actually said yes to some of those. And part of my obsession in, with timber framing turned into a part-time vocation of barn deconstruction, which is a great way to learn timber framing. This particular barn uh, was huge, and it was built in the 18, uh, 1870s. Um, but it's only uh, about two miles from where our uh, Alstead shop it, uh, was and is today. So all of that led to um, uh, whole huge piles of reclaimed materials. Um, I was in sort of a kit to, to build a workshop. <laughs> I was broke. Uh, I didn't have any money, really. <clears throat> but I had deconstructed two barns, four silos, a railroad trestle, a small mill. I had a whole bunch of, of recycled telephone poles, roofing from an old covered bridge, and said, well, that's enough. I think I have all the materials I need uh, you know, to build a workshop. Uh, the, there were silos, and silos are held together by uh, silo hoops. Uh, those silo hoops, which you know, I had whole piles of them uh, turned into rebar, and I cut them into lengths, and they became uh, cambered fasteners. So I didn't use mortise and tenon joinery in that first workshop. They were uh, column and beam, big timbers, but um, but the fasteners were those uh, cambered silo hoops. Uh, but in that uh, workshop, uh, once we you know had a roof over our heads. Uh, our first uh, timber frame was a part of a home I was building down the road that was not a timber frame, uh, but uh, there was a section of it where the client wanted uh, the look and feel of kind of a French country kitchen. So uh, I took the opportunity to use my uh, many of the barn timbers that I had and um, and built a uh, timber frame kitchen look, but I used mortise and tenon joinery um, just to try it, to see if I could cut the joints in one place, take them to another place and erect them and would they all fit? Uh, and could I, uh, you know, take that challenge like a cabinet maker or furniture maker and make a timber frame? So it was good, you know, that in that first effort that it was not structural, uh, it was more aesthetic. Uh, so I was testing myself, but I wasn't putting my uh, client at risk. Uh, so that was actually the first uh, timber frame. And that led to another one um, about 40 miles away from our workshop. And as you can see here in this photo, it was very much still under construction. Uh, as we, you know, be, began that first uh, timber frame project, uh, building inside this workshop that a little later looked like this. Um, and uh, uh, inside that workshop, we fashioned these timbers into the first timber frame uh, that we built in Deering, New Hampshire. So a few shots from that early workshop. Now uh, you can see we're not even insulated yet. Uh, you can call that a um, mortising machine with a uh, Forstner's bit. And, but, you know, inside the workshop, we had great working conditions, good bunks, uh, available tools. And as we were challenged by uh, making, you know, our first timber frame, at least we had the benefit of the workshop, good tools, a good place that we could work, work long hours if necessary to complete the project. So this uh, this was the first complete timber frame in 1974-75. Um, it's a combination of oak, all of these timbers in the roof area. Uh, these were mill timbers that I had salvaged from a mill in the Deering area. And there were some uh, hemlock timbers as well, but mostly oak, um, red oak, uh, some white oak. Uh, that we uh, simply purchased from local mills and fashioned into that timber frame. Uh, I was a carpenter. Um, so, you know, in that early house, the first timber frame, I did everything along 
with a, a partner, neighbor, friend. Um, but everything from the cabinets to the flooring to even this uh, furniture, uh, dining furniture here, stairways, doors, um, it was a complete home. And that was a goal, you know, to build better homes uh, and to use timber framing as a methodology as I had seen it and understood it from the old homes in uh, the Boston area and in Walpole area. Um, but, you know, with a new modern interpretation. So uh, that led to us being in business. Uh, that first home uh, we marketed and it got public attention because it was the first one in New Hampshire for almost 100 years. And uh, there was a lot of press about it. That put us in business and we were pretty soon building timber frames uh, all over, you know, kind of New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, Mass uh, Northern Massachusetts. So within, you know, 75 miles of our shop. Uh, I always used engineers, um, even from the very first projects to kind of consult. Uh, these are engineered timber structures. I needed to be a responsible builder. Um, so um, I consulted with uh, professionals. And uniquely, our first uh, engineer was from Charlestown, New Hampshire. Uh, he told me he did not really know a lot about the engineering of timber joinery. He could understand timber engineering of the timbers themselves, uh, so spans and um, modulus of elasticity and so on. So he it was very helpful, but he said, boy, I just don't know about this joinery. I'll consult, but I cannot uh, guarantee you know my work. However, he uh, he stamped a lot of our plans and it got us through those early years. And uh, his name was John F. Kennedy. And uh, I'm sure that somehow that gave us uh, credibility in those early years to have a, a John F. Kennedy as an engineer. <laughs> so. Uh, <clears throat> I was I was still learning, you know, very much learning, um, and on the path in uh, 1978 79 when I was writing my first book, I had enough experience to tell a story, uh, but I knew that if it was going to be a real revival, uh, we needed a whole community of people doing it. So very much, this book was kind of an invitation to. Uh, to the industry, to friends, to colleagues, to anyone, to, that this is a wonderful way to build. Uh, you know, let's let's have more people doing it. Um, let's learn as a community. Let's make it available again uh, throughout the country. That was kind of what I was trying to achieve with the book, not to demonstrate that I had all the knowledge that was needed, but that we needed a community to create that knowledge. But one of the, the critical things about, <laughs> about that book is that um, I was committed to a better way to insulate as well. So we were not going to insulate as they did in uh, the 19th century um, or you know the 18th century. We needed a better way to insulate. So reviving the timber frame method for sure, but how do we develop a better insulating method that would meet all of the challenges that I learned uh, from the energy crisis? So that led to uh, developing a structural insulated panel system. Um, we called it um, a stress skin panels in those early years. Um, the uh, prototype that became uh, a model for the first company to actually manufacture SIPs was actually um, made by uh, Amos Winter and I in our workshop in uh, 1976. And we um, put the early version of these panels on one of my homes in 1977. So there was not a whole industry yet, but, um, but I stuck my head out and promoted an idea that uh, took hold later. Um, and I'm just showing these photos. My home was built in 1979. Um, it had the benefit of SIPs, which I think was uh, a responsible insulating method then. Uh, we've gone past it now, just to uh, bring you up to date. But uh, as a result, you know, this was a very, very energy efficient home when it was first built. Um, uh, passive solar could 
pretty much heat it on any sunny day, even in the coldest of winter. Uh, so I've been, you know, with a little bit of wood heat and passive solar ever since. Uh, this is my home now with other additions, and that's the inside of it. Um, the entire timber frame was built with, believe it or not, timbers that were rejected for our clients. Uh, we called it the boneyard. And uh, for one reason or another, you know, they, it didn't meet our criteria. Uh, it was good enough for my own home. So uh, that's how that was built. Uh, so what was um, and into the heydays now, uh, heydays being, you know, when things we were on the path and really learning and uh, we had a, a team of people who were uh, creative and capable and skilled by then. Uh, so a little bit about how we advanced from then. So here's here's the shop um, as it grew a little bit. Um, unfortunately, this is before um, restaining it, but but you'll see that original shop. And then an addition we put on later and a little office that was actually a part of a class project. Um, <clears throat> so that was our workshop in Pratt Road um, in Alstead. Um, and to <clears throat> short circuit that story, it's now the uh, headquarters for the Timber Framers Guild and Hartwood, uh, the education side of the guild. Um, <clears throat> early years in our company, um, you know, recognizing that one of the things that, you know, we needed to do was develop a good culture of craft and commitment and how do, you know, how do we as a team learn together, grow together. Uh, so that's an early crew. Um, uh, this fellow is Chris Madigan, who is uh, still um, got connected to the guild for on all those years. And Tom Page was his partner for many years. So they had a, they, I say, graduated from our shop and went on to develop their own company. Uh, Dennis Markham, who was with us for 42 years, um, and Jeff Coleman, who is still with us as a company, my wife and daughter and uh, other colleagues and friends. Um, and Johannes, this is um, the Neary's who we built that um, uh, shop for uh, in your class. So uh, Michael and uh, Katie uh, Neary, and that's me with my younger daughter. In, uh, in 1984, there was a big meeting in our shop that led to uh, the founding of the Timber Framers Guild. Um, so that was had an incredible influence on all of us and our company, of course, to uh, establish a guild and be connected then with other timber framers, you know, kind of all over the country, but especially, you know, the Northeast where we live. Um, you're seeing the backside of Jack Sobin uh, here, and many of you know about him. If you don't know of him, uh, you'll you'll hear more, or you probably did during this conference. Um, uh, in those early years, uh, actually leading up to founding the Guild, uh, I was really good friends with uh, Ed Levin and Ken Rohr, who had a company in the north of us that's called Paradigm. And... It was the only, for a while, it was the only other timber frame um, company that I knew of. And uh, timber, uh, other people who were as, uh, as obsessed as we we were. Uh, so uh, fast friendship, uh, really, really talented, intelligent, capable craftsmen who, you know, clearly had a, a big influence on us, uh, a big influence on the guild going forward. Um, and I'm sure you heard the story about Ken Rohr um, uh, from others there. And uh, Jack Sobun, who still plays a big role in in uh, timber frame education and uh, writing and research. Um, so um, the guild is everything. Um, the community of people working together who, you know, might otherwise be co competitors, but really understand that if we cooperate and learn together, we'll all uh, do better as individuals. Uh, we were doing a lot of teaching at the time, um, <clears throat> including the class that Johannes attended. Um, and, you know, these were, we always did them as actual projects. 
for uh, neighbors and friends and in the community. So we would find a project, turn it into a class um, and, you know, make a, uh, a timber frame large or small that would be useful for people or for the community. It is by far the best way to learn, teach. Um, and so, you know, we're teaching in a workshop environment, um, but boy, we're we're learning more than we ever teach. That's always been true. And uh, I think this is 1988. I might be wrong. It might be 1989. I should have checked. But uh, uh, this old house <coughs> uh, engaged me. And uh, you'll hear about this later. Um, our engineer, Ben Brungraber, to take a look at this barn um, to in preparation for renovating it into a home. This was in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, so we did an evaluation of it. Uh, it was rotten. It was just full of dry rot. Unfortunately, the roof had been leaking for many years. Um, so in our evaluation, it, we really condemned it. And uh, and here's, you know, photos that they actually did, uh, um, I, I, this was a live video on national TV of uh, us pulling that barn down, and you can see the frass and dust rising, um, you know, as that building crashed into the ground. It was really more dust than timber, unfortunately. But we decided um, with this old house on national TV to turn that into a class and rebuild that barn as a new barn. Uh, we engaged guild friends um, from around the country to help teach the class. And at the end of uh, seven days of work, we raised a this timber frame, whoops, I'm sorry, on national TV, and it really introduced the uh, country uh, to uh, timber framing, um, you know, through that television program, and it, uh, it's called the Concord Concord Barn was the name of the series, a 13-part series. And it, today, to today, this old house is still um, a very active uh, television program. But that series remains its most popular. And I'm sure it's because of all of this. Um, and, and, you know, that beautiful experience of cutting and raising a timber frame that the whole country had a chance to see. I, I think I heard that you uh, also told the story of this project that uh, we did as a guild ahead of uh, a conference in Pennsylvania. Uh, incredible uh, community event with timber framers from all over the world participating to build you know, these two uh, timber frames side by side. The project started on a Thursday uh, before the conference. We actually dedicated complete buildings, complete with water, power, paint um, done on Sunday afternoon, working um, around the clock. The guild members kind of went back to the guild, but I worked with about 500 people in the local community to complete the homes. Um, so <clears throat> I was pretty tired by Sunday afternoon, but what an amazing experience. We, uh, we had the benefit of being having influence from around the world in our company. <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, Masahiko Ishikawa, or Ishikawa-san, um, who joined our company in uh, 1985, spent a year with us, totally changed us. Um, you know, we were learning by doing, by studying, by looking at old buildings. Uh, Ishikawa-san knew. He had been trained by masters who were trained by masters going back uh, 2,000 years. So we were questioning, but he knew. Uh, you know, different language, different culture, different kinds of timber frames, but we had way more in common uh, that we didn't have. Um, and, and that influence was just huge for our company, including... Um, Ishikawa-san was with us when we were doing our early uh, and very challenging compound joinery projects. Um, so, you know, this was, you know, this kind of compound joinery here. We had not attempted that before. 
Um, but with Ishikawa-san's guidance, uh, we got through our early projects and then uh, it changed, basically changed the geometry of the buildings that we could accomplish. Um, and then um, a little later, we got connected to the Compagnons in France, our first Compagnon who joined us for a period of time with Boris Noel. Uh, same thing, you know, training that went back, you know, a thousand years or more. Um, so Boris uh, knew the Compagnons know they're educated, they're trained. Uh, uh, they they have masters who train them. They go through a program that lasts about 12 or 15 years. Um, so we had the benefit of getting connected first with Noel, uh, Boris Noel, and then uh, for years later, other um, compagnons who joined us for six months, nine months, or a year. Uh, so they also um, affected our company and became a part of our DNA and helped us again to uh, be capable of doing some more uh, complex work. This is one of our compagnons. Um, kind of holding a class in the in our in our shop, kind of teaching some of the uh, layout techniques. And then uh, we had interns from Germany as well. They were typically engineers. This is uh, Aneta, uh, who actually married one of our project managers, so she's still in the area and a very very competent uh, timber frame engineer. This is Hans Porsche's. Um, who is uh, CEO of our company um, today. He joined us as an intern, friend, colleague, um, and had a huge influence on us. I won't go through all of this, but through the years, you know, our, our uh, simple tools, you know, became more complex. We were and are dedicated <coughs> to better tooling. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry for my cold, and that's why you're uh, you should be happy I'm not there with you. <coughs> um here's Ishikawa and his influence on us. But you can see, um, you know, we were dedicated to developing tools that would make our work more efficient, uh, more effective. We did not continue to stick with only hand tools. And I'll tell you that story, and I don't apologize for it. Um, by 1997, you know, we had uh, CNC equipment, and we do some of that today. So an entire evolution of tooling over time as well. Um, this is Reese Atchison, who actually developed this early um, and really incredible mortising machine <clears throat> that gave us more efficiency and accuracy. Um, and helped us to execute uh, larger projects. Uh, he also wrote a program uh, to kind of automate the uh, development of compound joinery. We were spending a lot of time drawing it before we lay, do, did, did the layout. Um, Reese, who was just a brilliant, brilliant, is a brilliant person, uh, wrote a program that was a front end to AutoCAD to make that um, a lot more efficient so that we could make kind of normalize uh, compound joinery in our work. Uh, that's the mortising machine at work. Um, brilliant, brilliant thing that uh, Reese did. This is uh, in our early shop. Uh, ben Brungraber, um, uh, Dr. Brungraber, <laughs> uh, uh, engineer, joined us in uh, 1986. Uh, he had been, well, I'll tell you a little bit about that, but he had been doing a doctoral thesis at Stanford in uh, tension joinery and timbers. So he was the expert in the country at the time. And, uh, you know, when I made the connection with Ben early on, I also made a commitment to find a way to get him, bring him into our company. And I was successful in doing that. He brought his best friend, Brian Smeltz, with him. He said it was a twofer, uh, and that turned out to be, you know, lucky for us, too. And just Brian is, was an incredible human being, contributed hugely to our company. Unfortunately, he passed away um, in 2001. 
Uh, we're still working with Ben today. He worked with us for 20 years and had a huge influence on us, on the guild, on the industry. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, when we first met Ben, he was uh, in the midst of doing his doctoral thesis. Uh, so he needed to do some testing of uh, bents and tension joinery. Uh, we worked with him and uh, built some bents for him to test and deconstruct or demolish, I, I guess. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and that contributed to his uh, research. And then, you know, later uh, he joined us. So here's you know one of the tools that uh, Ben had developed early on. Uh, to test uh, tension joinery. And, um, you know, the, the the bottom line of this is that what Ben learned in this testing is some of the joinery just didn't pass muster for the contemporary uh, engineering requirements. Um, and we had to rethink uh, joinery, you know, although we were dedicated early on uh, to traditional joinery and techniques. Um, we were also dedicated to um, being able to build buildings around the around the country, and of course they had to meet modern uh, engineering requirements. So um, that led to some innovation. Uh, but because of uh, Ben's influence and having, you know, a capable structural engineer on staff, we could also take on larger and more complex buildings. You know, it was one thing, could we build them? It was another thing, you know, did we have the capacity um, and experience to do the engineering? Um, so with Ben, we had both. Uh, our company had evolved to the point where we could execute work at this scale, um, but Ben brought us the capability to do the engineering at this scale. Uh, this is the Vermont building not far from us. Uh, but one of the things that been learned is that this tension joinery uh, was a real challenge. And um, so we began to exper experiment with other kinds of joinery, some of it derived from England, others, uh, uh, another influence was Japan, uh, early uh, mill building uh, engineering from North America. Um, so <clears throat> All of that kind of led us to splines, using splines as a connection, as opposed to a mortise and tenon joint, which would have, you know, needed to meet here. And of course, the length of the tenon is restricted by the depth of the column. So uh, with Ben, uh, you know, we began to really experiment and develop this spline uh, technique. You see another example here. Uh, in this uh, Gambrel building uh, at this uh, roof knuckle, you know, these are all splines uh, to kind of assure uh, the strength of that connection. Uh, here's another version. This is um, using some of the Japanese joinery that we had learned through Ishikawa-san, uh, uh, basically a through tenon that became a spline on the adjacent timber and then was uh, attached with uh, wedges. So you know, it could be sophisticated like this or, you know, simply um, uh, pegged, but that became uh, a part of the mix of what we as a company did in many projects and uh, many other people in the guild uh, having the benefit of, of Ben's engineering expertise also uh, took on the spline method. Uh, here's a... Another Gambrel building that we did, and you can see it's pretty much all about splines. Um, another example here, kind of a low spline there, you know, from the other side. Well, not that one, but on this one, there might be a high spline on the other side. And here's another example. I'll show you a little bit about this. This is another Ben innovation. And I'm using that in air quotes because Nothing is really new in timber framing, uh, but this is a keyed beam, kind of taking two beams and stacking them using these keys for shear. And then there are pegs and bolts, you know, through the top of it to turn those two beams into one for bigger spans. Um, here's Ben. Um, 
pretty happy after uh, this incredible uh, structure went up. Uh, it first did not raise all the way. We had to get a bigger crane. So been celebrating with a beer after uh, it finally went up. But this is the sort of thing we could accomplish as a company by then. Um, here's some more of that spline joinery, but you know, very complex uh, connections that became a norm over those years. Uh, this is a um, a red cedar um, tree log uh, that we got from the west coast, um, <clears throat> and use it as the center of an octagon building. Um, and we were able <laughs> able to make you know all of these uh, difficult connections, which were now becoming easier and easier, uh, into that into that log and create this unique uh, structure. It's uh, still today a project that we're real proud of. We were architects as well, uh, so you know the buildings that we did met our clients' requirements. Uh, we were still kind of innovating, you know, for us, you see kind of our, a little bit of Japanese influence and in the feel of this kind of building. And, uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, our European influence from the Compagnons and others, uh, this is Douglas Fir uh, and some of our architecture. Uh, that same project had a library, a separate library and uh, studio. And so this was that library. This was all uh, fur that was reclaimed from a mill building um, on the West Coast. Um, these uh, curved beams were actually just resawn and then uh, glued back together, resawn into flitches, if you will, and then glued back together uh, to create this uh, beautiful curve. So basically the glue joints sort of are hidden in that vertical grain. This, uh, these curves became kind of a part of our uh, company um, identity over the years. So in 2001, we moved from Alstead to Walpole. Uh, this uh, building is our offices and timber frame shop today. Uh, this building was initially uh, for panelization and offices. Uh, that's changed over the years. Uh, here's panels being built in that building, timber frames in this building, and the Pratt Road shop then being converted to uh, millwork and woodworking. Uh, so that's the Pratt Road shop as it basically is today. Uh, this is inside that uh, large um, timber frame shop that is our Walpole facility. Uh, here you can see one of our glued up um curves another one over here for a project that we're working on with these two talented timber framers but having the space in the shop <laughs> and the overhead cranes uh, even the ability to bring a forklift in has really uh, helped us to be able to execute you know much larger and more complex projects as i said curves became a part of our identity for a while. Sometimes they were only curves. Uh, usually we would do these glue ups ourselves uh, just to customize them. Um, in 2008, we did another project with this old house, this national TV show. Uh, this was another 14 part series, taking it from the shop all the way through uh, all of the construction. Uh, so another timber frame went up on national TV. Um, this one was a combination of recycled oak, uh, fur, re uh, reclaimed fur, and even some uh, some ribs uh, from a boat yard in the Boston area that was discovered in the big dig in Boston. So these, these timbers were several hundred years old. Um, it just had never been turned into a, <laughs> into ships. <laughs> so uh, there you see that there. Uh, our company did all the mill work as well, as, for, as well as the furniture, made doors, um, uh, cabinets, um, milled for the flooring, and many other things. So uh, again, whole buildings, not just timber frames. Uh, 
that's a steeple we did in Brattleboro. Uh, again, kind of demonstrating our ability to do more complex uh, kinds of projects. And, you know, anything about compound joinery was no longer intimidating uh, by the mid 1990s and into the early 2000s. Um, this is actually a relatively recent project, um, a national um, well-known uh, filmmaker um, lives in Walpole, New Hampshire. He wanted to convert a barn into a studio guest house. Um, once again, the barn really could not be moved. It was uh, uh, really kind of moldering into the earth. Uh, so we reconstructed it pretty much as it was, but with uh, new timbers. Uh, so this is um, hemlock timbers, uh, milled, rough sawn, kind of two sizes, too small. So there's a lot of, I'm sorry. So there's a lot of wane on the edge, kind of natural wane. So it looks, you know, really much, much like a uh, hand hewed uh, frame, but it's not. Uh, it was actually new and just kind of celebrated um, kind of the natural form of the logs that they came from. A building in uh, <clears throat> in Vermont uh, that's a school. Uh, these two uh, oak logs were just on the edge of my property um, up until an ice storm brought down two trees side by side. And um, <clears throat> After the ice storm, I grabbed the logs and put them aside, and they ended up in this building um, a few years later. Um, the rest of the frame has a lot of um, uh, live edge pine and a little bit of fir. Um, beautiful building, lots of natural forms. It's a school. So in the school on the solstice, um, that kind of slit in the roof that I guess you can kind of see here um, lines up on the solstice. And so there you see it kind of with this light right here on the chimney going straight down. Uh, again, kind of a demonstration of some of the larger projects we were able to do in that uh, area era. Um, this is a big uh, restaurant in uh, Killington, Vermont. Um, this is an 18 sided building. So I've forgotten the name for that, but there is a name for an 18 sided building. Um, <clears throat> but a beautiful building and a beautiful restaurant. Uh, proud to have been a part of it. One of my uh, most thrilling projects um, was this. Um, sculpture and um, structure on the fifth floor of the Denver Public Library. Um, <clears throat> it was all uh, reclaimed uh, timber and uh, it was definitely doing a job up there. It's in the reading room. So it's very quiet uh, up there, almost a sacred kind of environment. Um, then really beautiful, but since I come from Colorado, you know, I have um, our company had made, you know, kind of a, has a has a statement in Colorado that will be there for for generations, if not centuries. Uh, this is a kind of demonstrating, you know, getting pretty creative and innovative with timbers. Uh, this is a project in North Adams about um, uh, eight years ago, and. Uh, some glue lamb uh, timbers uh, that you know we we um, fabricated and uh, created this very unique form. Um, a building that I'm so proud of. It's it's a uh, kind of a music hall in a studio, so it's <clears throat> all about acoustics <clears throat> and an incredible place. So what is <clears throat> getting to the machine um, or getting to the end here and into more machines, uh, advancing our software, uh, integrating glue lamb timbers. And I know that's a controversial uh, topic here, but <clears throat> I'm going to just mention it unapologetically. Uh, increase timber in buildings, whether they're residential, commercial, or institutional. 
and uh, trying to make a high level of energy efficiency a built-in norm, uh, not an exception, but the outcome of a process. So all of that has led us to um, 1997, our first uh, CNC machine, um, <clears throat> which uh, helped us to be more efficient. We made a commitment to not let it <laughs> uh, compromise the quality of our work. So often we would need then and now to um, complement that with handwork where necessary. Um, <clears throat> and then bringing up to today, um, this is a another machine, a robot drive uh, from Germany that we use <clears throat> to fabricate uh, timbers and and uh, <coughs> large and small, as as you can imagine. And uh, this is a uh, production facility in Keene, New Hampshire, that we opened about six years ago. And it's uh, all about panelization. Um, this is for all of, you know, for energy efficiency. And uh, this factories um, for this audience is very much modeled on uh, Swedish factories. I visited um, many around Sweden and they became a little bit of a model for how we as a company could also make high performance enclosure systems a norm with you know high density insulation um <clears throat> uh air tightness that would be assured uh and an insulation uh level that would just become common so obviously a big investment and a big commitment uh but um the point i'm making in this whole presentation is that we were committed to a better way of building and the better way of building included um, structure, craft, and insulation. Uh, so all kinds of tools. Uh, I kind of like this. This is Paul Boa, who is an incredible uh, timber frame crafts person, woodworker. Um, here he is at a computer, you know, using this uh, CADWORK software. You can see his chisel and a uh, group of uh, chisels over here. Uh, he knows how to use them. He knows how to keep them sharp. That's a Japanese chisel, I can see. Um, but, you know, but like the rest of us, you can also use these other tools that we often use uh, for our work or get into the CNC machines that you see in the background. Um, we have not left this behind, but we are, you know, as a company looking forward um, toward the future. And, you know, we were dedicated to better tooling from the beginning, bringing technology to it, um, to our work, to make it more accessible and um, more affordable and being able to execute work on a larger scale as necessary. So I know, again, this is controversial, but here we are. Um, we do use glue lamb timbers, especially in these kind of larger scale uh, institutional work um, where, you know, there are huge spans and traditional solid sun, you know, timber timbers would not make the spans or complete the work. And we're trying to replace concrete and steel uh, with wood in buildings like this. So we, we do get involved with buildings of this scale. Here's a good example. This is a common ground high school in Connecticut. We worked with Gray Organsky. Um, uh, we did the engineering, they did the architecture. Uh, this building is uh, CLT, cross laminated timber and glue lamb. Um, <clears throat> and this is a building in um, Amherst, Mass. Uh, Bruner Cott Architects. Uh, incredible living building challenge building. So that's a really big heavy lift. Uh, we're so energy efficiency and every other aspect um, kind of built into this project. So we did all of the um, structure and timber engineering and timber framing at the industrial level. So you'll see some metal connections, which were kind of critical for that level of 
of engineering. Uh, this is back to that um, school in Connecticut. Um, in order to make a truss like this, the only way it could be done was with um, glue lamb timbers. This is in our shop in Alstead, um, I mean in Walpole. And you can see the scale of this work is just at, at a complete different level. Uh, here are these trusses going into place. Um, the completed building that has uh, these, I think, beautiful timbers and, uh, and then also the CLTs that are exposed. So much better environment for the students and concrete and steel is this beautiful wood building that um, we were, <clears throat> we did, um, engineered, fabricated and constructed. Uh, we've used CLTs in other ways. This home is high on a ridge in Idaho, uh, takes very heavy wind loads from time to time. Uh, we used a CLT, uh, actually two of them, um, to um, to kind of be an anchor or mast in the middle of the building, uh, kind of a unique, you know, connected these uh, this timber structure to a CLT to assure its rigidity. And uh, this is us using CLTs and glue lambs in a very creative way. So. Um, that's something for you to think about. Maybe you'll have questions. Um, uh, again, you know, unapologetic about moving forward and using wood in our, especially the commercial and institutional buildings. So what's next? Uh, the big thing is that we have a climate emergency. Um, you know, it's not uh, not just heating up the planet, but you know, we've we've cooked the planet, and um, and I don't know what's going to happen, um, but our company is now dedicated to no fossil fuels. Um, we're going to be uh, committed to merging craft and technology, as we always have been. And we're going to continue on the path uh, to find a better way to build uh, for the industry. When I talk about the climate emergency, I, um, uh, you know, I used to show just pictures of fires and floods, and and uh, uh, since then I just show uh, photos of my grandchildren, and I want them to live in a, a livable world. <laughs> uh, so, and so this is why it matters, um, and why actually for our company this matters as much as um, the craft of timber framing is. Uh, building a better world and <clears throat> being a part of the solution. That's it. Sorry if it went a little long, but I, I sure enjoyed um, the opportunity to present to you. I'm, uh, for, for all of you, I, you, you should be happy I'm not there. I do have a cold and I'm getting over it. So this was a way to do this and, uh, yeah. safely. Thank you so much. This has been great. And next time you come to Costa, look me up and you'll get one of these. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.